It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators. The famous and not so famous. The controversial and the light and fluffy. We have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Hello, hello, hello. Welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show. It's me, Douglas Coleman. I wanted to come on and just give a sincere apology to all the musicians and bands who have been submitting that we just haven't had a chance to get their music out onto the show. Yes, we're still doing it, but uh, we started a video edition show a year ago, a little over a year. And the show has been consuming all of my time. And I'm finding it more difficult to get through the music that we get submitted. But keep submitting. I love hearing the music. It's great stuff. And we will get it out there, I promise you. It just may take a little while. So with that, we've got three today. The interview is with Bob Weatherwax, who is from the very famous Weatherwax family of dog trainers in Hollywood. His family, his grandfather, his father, his uncle trained basically every dog <laughs> that you could imagine that was in any major Hollywood film. Uh, I think his uncle trained Toto from the original Wizard of Oz. And there were generations of lassies that the Weatherwax family trained, as well as Rin Tin Tin and uh, many of the other very famous dogs. So happy to have Bob on. Before we get to Bob, though, we do have to play the music, and we've got three tracks to play. The first one is It's Who I Am by Radio Drive, followed by Almost Never Give Up by Black Belt Theater, and finally Anywhere by Shane Martin. So again, my apologies to the bands and musicians for taking forever to get the music out, but here it is. Enjoy. <laughs> Never leave 
It's who I am.
You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on the Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. Douglas Coleman's Don't Do a Podcast is a dryly humorous rant about Douglas's pet peeve, the unrelenting torrent of podcasts hitting the web on a constant basis. As technology has put podcasting within the reach of anyone, many wholly unqualified people have taken the plunge. This witty polemic tries to persuade them from broadcasting their drivel using Douglas's brand of sarcastic humor. Now on Amazon, only 99 cents. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of the Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Hi, this is John Morgan, Production Supervisor for DJC Productions. You're listening to The Douglas Coleman Show. Okay, please welcome to The Douglas Coleman Show, Bob Weatherwax. Hi, Bob. How are you? Pretty good. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show. When I saw your name come through, I immediately recognized your last name. Uh, you've got a pretty famous lineage of... Uh, yes, <laughs> that goes of uncles and uncles and people who train dogs yeah and everybody trained dogs right well and famous ones well right but i mean your father and then also uh, your grandfather well, right? my uncle my uncle well no 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 uh my uncle jack trained toto for uh the wizard of oz the, uh, yeah yeah the wizard of oz and my other uncle trained old yeller for uh, old yeller for Disney, okay. and uh, we've had, a, you know, my brother, and there's like they do other shows. We did a lot of movies between those three brothers, but my father was the most successful. And your father was the trainer of the original Lassie, is that correct? Yes, and, and yes, yes, the original Lassie and every Lassie since, except when I took over and I trained him. But I also worked with him uh, for over 20-some years. So I apprenticed under him. Actually, I started working for him when I was a little baby, and he used me to train the dog to kiss and stuff like that. So I was with the original. I'm the only living person that was with the, the uh, original Lassie. So how did your, your family yeah. get into dog training? How did that start? Well, my father came off of a ranch, working ranch, and uh, his father uh, had college for herding. And he, he herded uh, Angora uh, goats. And he would work them off on a hill. My father said he'd get up there with his hat, and he'd signal the dog which way to go. And when he saw that they were going that way, he'd signal them to go and over, cut them off, bring them back, because that's what they are, the sheep dogs. And uh, so, and then he trained horses for wild wolves, wild buffalo built wild wolf circus, because uh, my father was a trick rider also. Then all the fancy Cooper mounts and all the Point Express mounts. And then he started working for other people with dogs because he loved dogs and other trainers in the business. And, uh, and uh, he got on. One day they were looking for a trainer because they'd had failures with a movie. They were trying to make Lassie come home. And if nobody could see him to get the quality to do what they want them to do, so they... My father's established a pretty good reputation by then. And they said, well, let's try this guy Weatherwax and see if he's come up with a colony. Well, it just happened to be that my father did have one that he had uh, shipped to and given, given to another guy to take care of it for a while. And he went and got the dog back. And he, went, and he trained on him as quickly as he could. He gets at least the beginnings of what they wanted. And there was a river scene where the dog had to... Uh, 
swim the river. And uh, they happen to be there going to film it. And uh, for you, it's a film test. See what he, how he looks. And, and as he came across, I mean, it was all fluky things. As he came across, there just happened to be a technicolor camera because there were only all three in Hollywood at that time. And it was, it, it was, they were testing it, running it. And while he, he swam down the river, he came pretty close to the end of that, that, that uh, technicolor camera. So therefore, they told him, shoot him, shoot him coming across that river. See what he looks like in color. Well, he came across the river. He did it perfectly. He came out. My father had him struggle. He always added things. He liked to embellish. And, uh, and they saw the color of him and everything. And they says, uh, uh, they said, Pal swam in. His name was Pal. They said, Pal swam in, and last he swam out. And that was it. He stopped, took over the show and became Lassie. So this was the the original Lassie for the film or for the yeah, TV series? Yeah, yeah, no, for the film, Lassie Come Home. Oh, okay. Do you remember what year that was? Yeah, 1943, I believe. 1943, okay. Now, was your yeah. father also the trainer for the Lassie in the TV series, the one in the 50s? My father owned the train, the name, and everything. Oh, okay. He owned the whole, whole caboodle of the thing. He bought the name from MGM and... Uh, towards the end of his, 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 his contract there. So Lassie was your father's brand, basically. You know? Yeah, it was his brand. Yeah, they didn't use that word in those days. But. <laughs> no, yeah. they didn't. That's a, that's a new word, but uh, yeah, today it would be his brand. Absolutely. Well, today it would be his business, because we had a business that we called Studio Dog Training School, and we trained other dogs for movies, too. So we, it couldn't be his brand, because he did more than that. Oh well, that's true. Yeah, one of his brands then. Um, yes. Yeah. Weatherwax trained dogs was his brand. Okay. So now you've obviously done dog training yourself. What What is the most difficult thing you find to teach dogs to do? To work in a movie without having to be able to talk to them and have them be able to do anything that that director comes up with. And believe me, uh, um, my father and I are both in the world almanac. Has, have trained the greatest animal star of all time. He is doing it eventually, originally, and then me eventually doing it upon his passing. Also, having worked with him all those years. And there's nobody has the talent. That's why that last one they tried to do, because I, I left them. Uh, I decided I was getting too old for it, and they hired somebody to do that movie that punk. It failed because that's the reason the first one was failing. The dog didn't look like he was acting. My father did more than teach him tricks. He taught him to act. They looked like they were really doing everything. And this was back in the days before CGI and where you really had to have the dog do what it was supposed to do, right? You bet. You bet. The things Lassie did were incredible. I know I trade a lot of them. So how many Lassies have there been now? How many lassies? There are no more lassies. I, my last, the last, I've lost the last official lassie. He passed away on me about a year and a half, two years ago. Oh. And he was the last official Red Weather Wax lassie. Now, there's more colleagues out there. They can call themselves anything they want, but they aren't a lassie. We have the original, I have the original thought print here, a cast of it that we have made because we used to sign so many paw prints that we had rubber cast made. Nobody has that cast. Nobody in the world has that cast. Nobody knows where he's buried. They try to get me, trick me into telling them, but I won't do it. <laughs> yeah, a guy calls up and says, hey, I got a present for your dog uh, for his birthday. Uh, could you tell me where he is so I can give it to him? I said, oh, come on. That's, that's the newest, ugliest approach I've seen yet. <laughs> uh, he it, thought he was going to pull one on. on your, uh, I'm looking at your father's bio right now. And it says that uh, your father was responsible for training the official New York Mets team mascot in the 1960s, a beagle named Homer. Yes, yes. He also trained the Hounds of Basketball. He trained uh, uh, some of our gang comedy. My father trained a thousand dogs. I mean, he, he didn't always have Lassie. He had to earn his bones. He just didn't come off the street. Here's this guy, man. He knows how to work this car and do all this stuff. They said they went out and looked for him. They said, well, we're looking for this guy at Red Weatherwax. He's already established quite a reputation at MGM. 
They said, we want to try him on his collie, see if he can get a collie. And they did. He could do it. They, they, they hit the jackpot. It was a thing where everything had to come together. Uh, they had the, the story, a great story by Eric. Eric uh, I, they, they had, uh, they did, they finally got the dog and they got my father. And those three elements were put it together and made it just not a dog movie. What was his magic? What do you think it was? Uh, what's the magic for graduating school? He sat there and worked with his father. His father taught him everything he knew and then he taught, went on to teach me everything he knew. And we just kept putting it putting the information together. It's like anything else, like, you know, high school and then college. Yeah, but I, I don't know. It seems to me it would take a, a different sort of touch to really be good with working with live animals. Well, what the Almanac says is trading the greatest star dog of all time. He did that because he practiced. How does anybody ever get anywhere? Practice. Well, okay. But, I mean, dogs have personalities. Dogs have... You know, you're damn right. We know how to we know how to use them too. Yeah, we we use them, put them on a show. And we know how to use. Them. We know how to take that personality, bring it out, and make it work wherever we like it to work. We we be supposed to be happy, then we bring them in with his tail wagging. We can control that. We can make them wag his tail. We can make them stop wagging his tail. We can make his head come down. Uh, there was a show, a shot with uh, Liz Taylor, uh, where she has measles, and Lassie comes in. And, and, and the director lets you go because he, he doesn't know what a dog will do. And, and the dog's supposed to come and walk up to the, walk up to her and see she has measles. Well, most trainers, they just get the dog to walk up there because that's all they're capable of. But my father took and had the dog walk, he's come through the door, uh, happy. And then as soon as he look over at her, drop his head and slowly start to walk towards her. And then she says, it's okay, Lassie, it's just the measles. And then you see him start to perk up a little bit, and then he goes on over. He sits, he puts his head down on her on her, on her chest, and he licks her. And my father choreographed that whole thing. So nobody said, they had no clue what that dog would do. They thought, well, if we just get him in there, that'll be nice. But when they saw that, well, it's what Louis B. Louis, Louis B. Mayer saw it at the Radio City Music Hall. He said... Uh, he said, uh, we're going to shoot this fix, and we're going to shoot it in color, and we're going to open it to Radio City Music Hall. This B movie that was going to be nothing in black and white with a dog, all of a sudden became their big hit of the year. Lassie was the third highest grocer at MGM. Wow. And then, yeah. That, yeah. And then that spun off years and years of Lassie's, you know? Yes, that's what gave it such longevity. Yeah. So you've got a book out, right? Your book is called Four Feet to Fame, A Hollywood Dog Trainer's Journey. Yeah, yes. Uh, it, it, it covers a little bit of what I'm talking about with what my father went through and how we did it. So th it's a, this is the story. This is the story of your dad and of you, yeah? Yeah, yes. Okay. It's, 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 it's you know, we had a, we had to sort the book up because it's you know, way too big. But uh, it, it, it more or less gives you a good rundown of what went on. Uh, how long has the book been out? Oh, I don't know. It's been out about uh, a year or so. Uh, I put it out the wrong time. I put it out when they were going to computers. So it's a book form. So that doesn't work quite as well. Oh, there, it's only in, in hardcover or paperback? You don't have it in ebook? Yeah. Hardcover or paperback? No, I don't have an ebook. Oh, okay. Maybe that's what I should do with it. Well, it's easy enough to do on Amazon. Yeah. Uh, listen, do you have a website uh, for the book or a personal website that you want to give out? People come check it out. I, I do. I do have a personal website, but I don't know what it is. I have a person that keeps track of that for me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, but, not, but, but we know how to do, do we know how to get a hold of you? Well, I, if, if somebody, I, I mean, I'm talking about for my, my listeners, if they want to look you up, if they've never heard of you. Uh, so they could just go to Bob Weatherwax, well, probably Google search. And all kinds of stuff would yeah, come just, up. Yeah, just Google. Yeah. Oh, all kinds of things. We're, we're in all kinds of stuff. Okay. I just had Oprah Winfrey send me a letter. She found me. Oh, great. Are you going on her show? No, I. It was she was uh, uh, told me to talk to me about my book. Oh, okay, super. She said she enjoyed it. Well, what it is is 
it was personal. It wasn't for advertising. It was, he, uh, I read where he, uh, there's an older article where he said the only thing that really made her happy, because she came, you know, everybody knows she came up as a really poor childhood. Right. And she said, uh, she said the only thing she lived for during the week was to go home on Sunday night and watch Lassie. So I said, she deserves a book. And I wrote, sent her a book, signed it, and then she sent me uh, this note back thanking me inside it. Oh, that's great. That's super. All right, Bob. Well, thanks so much for coming on the show. It was nice talking to you. Nice meeting you. Did I fulfill your wishes? <laughs> yeah, it was great. I loved hearing these stories. I love hearing any stories about classic Hollywood and people that were actually there. And yeah, it's always great. Yeah, we were there. Well, okay then. It's right. nice talking to you. Well, and uh, as long as you're happy, I'm tickled. All right. <laughs> thanks again, Bob. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.